What's up, you shower of bastards? You can call me Zero, and we're back for episode 2 of Grand Prix World, where last time we didn't achieve very much other than talk bollocks about how the game works and get slapped back by Pedro Diniz. Um, so before we dive into qualifying, there's a few things that I still need to do. Um, mainly on the design front, obviously. Last time out, we set 50% of our designers to work on next year's car, which is it's really important to get a head start on that. Also, we discovered we have some quite serious potential reliability problems uh, that we'll be facing across the season, so we want to try and fix that as soon as possible. I'm going to try and improve the reliability of our electronics. Um, I think 15% should be enough for that. Now, the other consideration is, am I going to do some testing? Uh, the problem with doing testing, of course, is that it adds wear to your your race cars, uh, and it does cost money to to run to obtain that data. Um, what we'll do first of all is we'll build some spare parts. That efficiency is just awful. Um, yeah, we can build two spare parts around at the moment until we strengthen that team or improve the efficiency. Um, this thirty percent of the engineers left, that's they're not going to be able to achieve anything. So that's a complete waste. Um, if I recall, we can only do R&D for the fuel. I'm not sure that's necessarily what we want to be doing at the moment. So I think we will do some testing. Uh, at the moment we get 10 free miles, which obviously isn't going to achieve very much. It's going to cost us $500 per mile of testing and really you want to be doing more than 150 miles to get some some reasonable data um, ideally more than that but as you can see it gets quite expensive um, it's the beginning of the season let's let's go a bit all out let's go for 200 miles of testing and we want to focus mostly on setup five percent of our engineers can work on setup and 5% can work on uh, research and development each. Um, so the difference between uh, Enfiklung and Forschung is that uh, the first one here basically will establish handling problems with the car and enable you to design and build uh, upgrades throughout the season. And Forschung, that generates sort of research points, I suppose, that once you've filled the bar, you can deploy those points and boost your research in, in all areas that you're currently um, producing uh, new parts or technologies. So it's good to keep all of those full. We're not going to do any research for engine or tyres because there's no benefit at all. That we, we don't get points that we can use internally, it just it, it would be a complete waste. And for the fuel, it's not going to be such a big deciding factor on overall performance that I feel comfortable using some of our mechanics on it at the moment. Um, I'd rather focus on the three areas that are going to be of the most immediate benefit and maybe later in the season if we find that that power deficit is really getting to be a, a problem and we're slipping back to where the Tyrrells and Minardis are then maybe we can look at redressing the, the balance on the fuel. Um, the drivers, we will put 80% of our race drivers time onto setting up for the race and qualifying and We'll split the test driver's time 50-50 between uh, research and development. I think that's everything set up, so let's see what that achieves, other than a massive bill. Okay, so you see we've maxed out the setup bar, so uh, if you're being fair to your drivers then they have uh, five setup points each, and we've managed to max out the, uh, the research and development bar. Um, let's see what comes from that. Nothing. So all that's happened is, you can see here, uh, the car is sort of, I suppose, at 50% of its maximum capacity for, for handling. Um, it's not encouraging to start with a figure that low, but it's kind of what you'd expect for a team as, as small as Arrows. Um, obviously, the better your design team and the better your designers, the higher you'll start the season uh, with from this standpoint. Um, the handling problem is unknown, so we have to do some more testing to find out what's causing these problems, and then we can develop a part. So, 
while we still have 35% of our designers free, we're going to try and probably fail to develop a driver aid. Um, normally I wouldn't do this um, in the most of the first season, to be honest, on a, a smaller team, but an opportunity has presented itself, and um, for the first few races, none of our rivals are going to have driver aids, so we can't attempt to steal designs and copy designs, so um, we'll try and develop something in-house. Um, got to speculate to accumulate. Let's see what condition our car is for qualifying. Okay, they're 20% worn, so we will only fix up the actual race cars. Car 3 won't actually attend the race. Next up, before we dive into anything, we need to... Oh, looks good there. We need to begin negotiating some sponsors, which is something we didn't set up last time. Team sponsors are where you get the majority of your cash, but I'm not even going to try because in the first season, a team this small, no one's going to be prepared to work with us. Instead, what I want to do is try and get us a works engine deal. Uh, now, Mercedes and Ferrari are definitely not going to speak to us. But what you see here is how much money the company has and what their research and development is like. So that's an indication, basically, of how good their engine will be next year. And this is an indication of um, what financial resources they'll put into your team, I suppose. Um, so let's have a look who the work suppliers are. Peugeot we could go for. Ford have works engines. Um, Mechachrome and Hart only offer customer engines. And um, Mugen Honda has a single partner contract. Um, so really, Peugeot looks to be the stronger candidate, but only from a financial standpoint. In terms of producing a good engine, Ford seems to be the way to go. Um, what do we do here? I think, I think we'll go for Peugeot. We'll try and negotiate a work deal with Peugeot. So for that, I'm going to put, I would say, 45% of our guys on that. It's a big one. It's very, very important. Um, initially, it's it genuinely more important to get yourself a works deal as far as possible, um, simply because it provides you more money than negotiating individual sponsors would. Um, and... Why don't we go for ESO um, for our fuel supplier? They're, they're new. Uh, maybe they'll offer us a work deal. We can see, once we've done a bit of negotiation with them, what they're willing to uh, to do for us. And the remainder, I think we'll go for... There's only one works contract for each. Uh, we won't get a works tire, tire deal, but maybe we'll get something... A partnership possibly if we're very fortunate we are starting early so I'm going to go ahead and put 27% of our guys on tires I'm holding eight back and I will show you why right now um, I'm gonna put 5% of our staff on working on the quality of uh, the guest experience um, that's not really made a difference at all but you have to have some staff there and, and it seems a good number to have and um, you need at least 1% per VIP to open up these slots for invitations. We're going to spend a little bit of money on the season opener just to sort of um, make friends as it were. Now who to bring? Obviously Bridgestone's a no-brainer. They're a current sponsor and a potential new partner. And then obviously Peugeot and Esso. Um, I'm not too bothered at the moment while our current sponsors are mostly okay with us. Um, in fact they're all okay with us no spectacular relationships there but it's it's very hard to say at this stage if we're going to be able to retain any of them anyway so what we really want to do is maximize uh, the time and resources spent on securing these deals ideally partner works or uh, partner or hire so partner or works um, so that's the commercial team sorted um, I'm going to try and throw out a few more contract offers here. Um, Cowling Shaw, I don't know if I want to hold off that long. So we'll go for Mr. Edwards from Jordan. We'll try and get him for two years. No, but he's actually more likely to, to sign with us. 
Maybe we'll come back for him later. I don't really want to go lower than three stars, if I can avoid it. Harvey we're going to come back to later, simply because he's the he's the best middle of the field offer at the moment. He's certainly the cheapest three star, and um, he, in my experience, tends to improve rather than uh, decline, even at a sort of a lower lower end team. Um, on the commercial side, I'm beginning to think for the long-term security of the team that I might actually hire someone who's never worked in F1 before simply because they'll take a 0% contract and that's really important for us for the next um, two seasons so we will take Eva Manzoni and she can start in 1999 we don't want to replace Oliver just yet okay so that is pretty much all all the major work done um, all the staff that we've assigned to projects will work on that project over um, the course of qualifying and race and so we will set up for qualifying. Um, what you see here for each driver is how aggressive you're going to allow them to be in various various situations so um, how harshly you want them to defend the racing line um, how you would like them to deploy their brakes, can there be a late breaker do you want them to uh, take it quite easy? Obviously, we have reliability issues. And what we really want is, is getting guys to the end of the, the race. That's that's our main concern. Um, I think we're in a strong enough position that the Minardis are not going to be catching us, even if we're not firing on all cylinders. Tyrrell are a bit more of a concern. And obviously, Stuart and Prost are probably going to, um, to get ahead of us over the course of the season if they aren't straight from the off and obviously doing this we're not seeing the full potential of the car but finishing races poorly is better than not finishing at all unless you were like not to enter for financial reasons so we're going to try and get those guys to just just cool their jets a little bit uh, then it comes to setup now obviously there's lots of different areas here where you can spend your setup points and what you should be doing really is following the natural flow of your race engineers so you can see here that they feel it's important to put money on uh, put money put um, put points into uh, the difference between a dry or wet race so all this is basically suggesting is that it's unlikely to rain and the setup should perform better in dry weather um, so we'll put one in there put one in brakes one in speed, one in acceleration, and we're not too bothered about overtaking actually, so I will put one onto onto the surface. Uh, that's, it's basically setting up for a bumpier or a flatter track, and as I recall Melbourne isn't actually too bad in that regard. Um, we'll duplicate that setup for Mikasalo and we're going to have both drivers on the same setup just so we can evaluate where we're at and who we should be pouring our resources in. We'll give each driver a few few rounds to sort of find their um, find their level. Tyres. Obviously this is a, uh, the same decision as, as it's ever been. Um, you do have a hard and a soft compound in the dry and what we can see here is the soft obviously has a much higher grip level compared with the, the harder tyre but the harder tyre has a longer lifespan and much more rigidity and the softer tyre is a little bit better for getting up to temperature. I think what we're going to do actually is we're going to put both drivers on the harder tyre. It's quite a hot track, I'm not so worried about the, the temperature factor and I'm hoping we can save ourselves a pit stop, turn a two stop race into a one stop race and hopefully offset any reduction in performance by simply saving that, that time there. So we'll we'll set that up, and then finally we're just going to set up how we want our race team to uh, assign themselves. So what we want obviously is maximum efficiency on the pit stops. That's number one priority. Down here is uh, car security. That's sort of stopping um, rivals from spying on on your car, getting um, parts to duplicate. We've got nothing for anyone to nick. That that's the reality of the situation. So we're not going to bother there. What we are going to do is study the race 
of Stuart. We're going to look at Stuart initially until we figure out where everyone is. But Stuart, I think, will be our closest rival initially. And we're going to take a look at the McLaren for traction control. They'll have nothing for the first round, but they can develop parts very, very quickly. And I imagine two, three rounds in, they should start deploying uh, driver aids. And we want to be involved when they do, so we don't have to waste time and money designing our own. So with that in mind, let's get to qualifying before this video lasts a million years. Okay, so that's a lineup for this year. Um, sorry, the game just hang, hanged a little bit there. Um, obviously, if you want to figure out where everyone is for 1998, that's all on Wikipedia. We won't really be looking too closely at that until changes begin to happen. So we have light rain in qualifying. So our, our choice of dry compound tyre sort of becomes immaterial, really. So we're happy with the setup. Both cars are in good condition. Uh, we're going to put them on the intermediates initially, and the grip level on the track is 2 out of 5, so that's not great, but obviously our guys are holding back, they're keeping something in the tank. Now this is classic 90s um, qualifying rules, so you get 12 laps, uh, most of the time you'll do 4 sets of 3 laps, and fresh tyres for each one. Um, let's see where we're at. So yeah, he's got three laps worth of fuel in the car, so does Deniz. And no one's out on track at the moment, so I'll tell you what, let's go get a banker in. We'll, we'll put Salo out first. And then we'll throw out Deniz now. Okay, so what you can see here is basically very poorly rendered 3D models driving over photographs of the track. Um, not particularly impressive, it's not the strong suit of the game. Uh, for me the strong suit really is the, the overall simulation of relationship between uh, sponsors and teams and uh, cars and drivers and the engineering process overall. I don't know if you're seeing that blinking, hopefully that stops. It is one of the many issues that comes with running such an old game on Windows 7. So we're going to tell our guys just to just to ease off on the outlap. Um, the last thing we want is anyone to spin off and bin it into the wall because that will be them out of the, uh, out of the race. Um, so Deniz, yeah, that's a pretty good gap between them. I'm not too worried. Um, let's get ready to tell Salo to speed up. Oh, and some complete bastard has come out of the pit in front of us. Um, and that was a Benetton that's come out between our cars as well. It looks, to be honest, like the Niz is probably going to get a fairly clean lap, but I'm kind of worried about Salo. Let's uh, take a look at his situation. No one immediately in front of him, actually. The diagram kind of implied that was going to be a problem initially, but whoever car number four is has actually pulled out a decent gap, which is concerning. I believe that's Irvine. Yeah, okay, so we're seeing immediately the performance deficit of our car, actually, because that Benetton on its outlap is actually, it has uh, got past Mikasalo. Um, that's on an outlap, we're on a fast lap, so what we're seeing really is that the heart engine isn't great. The car, overall, if I recall, wasn't actually too bad, but it did have reliability problems in 1998, and we're not exactly fielding world-class talent, so now we need to call Salo in and we need to call Deniz in. We have Deniz on a 149.495 and Salo on a 152.124 which I guess uh, arose from his encounter with the Benetton on track. Not really much uh, else we could have done there really, it's kind of hard to predict when the AI are going to throw their cars out on track 
but we'll bring everyone in, uh, refuel, and then we'll take a look at what the quality of the track is and um, make a decision on when we're ready to send guys out again. Okay, so both our guys are back in the box, uh, thanks to the magic of modern technology. Uh, we're currently lying in 5th and 6th position, some 5 seconds or more off the pace uh, of the next placed driver, which is Fisichella in the Benetton. The track does seem to be already getting faster. Um, still, I'm not feeling confident to throw anyone out just yet. What I'm interested to see, though, is uh, where the Tyrrells and Minardis end up lying, because that really is, is where we would begin to become concerned. If we found that they were driving faster than us in qualifying, then we've obviously pulled our guys too far back. Uh, I'm fairly, fairly confident that won't actually be the case, and I've just noticed it has stopped raining. So... Actually, if we play our cards right and wait for the track to dry up, we might be able to let the AI use up some of their laps here and capitalise on that. Might find ourselves actually further ahead than we deserve to be. Obviously, we would f expect to fall back during the race. Um, not really much we can do about that this season. But let's see. Yeah, we're within two seconds of Johnny Herbert Sauber. Um, we don't obviously know what tyre compound he's on. Um, the track still appears wet, so I'm guessing he's still on the intermediates, but I'm not entirely sure the underlying simulation of the uh, the qualifying and race sessions. Um, but yeah, I am seeing water coming off the wheels of cars coming into the pit, so I yeah, I am a little bit concerned actually about that gap to Herbert, but we'll, we'll see how the session pans out. Join me in a few minutes and we'll throw Diniz and Salo out to the dogs. So something interesting has happened. Um, the track has really dried out and we're in a position where only three cars are within 107% required to qualify. Now I press this button down here to pass on a little bit of time a bit, let the, uh, the track dry out and unfortunately it will not let me come out of this, um, which might mean we don't qualify for our first race. Uh, which is a very special level of ineptitude, actually. I didn't expect that to happen quite so early, but the only option I seem to be able to have is to end the session. I will keep trying, um, but it might be that we join the majority of the grid and don't qualify. So, humiliating. Um, I have no idea what happened there, um, but along with many others, actually, we weren't in the 107% time because I couldn't get the cars back out on track. I've never encountered that, that error before, actually. So what we've learned there is that I'm going to have to off-camera uh, a lot of our waiting time and um, not try and speed time through again because obviously the time compression is not reliable. So we will not be racing in Australia. Um, I'm not too disheartened because that actually saves us quite a bit of money on spare parts and all kinds of potential issues there. We weren't looking particularly strong so we can take away from this that we need to prepare better for Brazil. Um, hopefully you'll join me next time where we will actually have a qualification and possibly a race if we're lucky. Thanks again. Just a final update. This is how the race actually ended for those that were interested. So uh, the podium uh, consisted of David Coulthard took the win, um, Schumacher took second and John Newhouse um, <laughs> took third for Williams. Um, Taking a look down it, uh, Coulthard lapped everyone up to ninth, and we had three failures, well, two failures and an accident, so Jano Trulli in the Prost uh, came off the track at some stage, and Heintel Frensen in the Williams had an engine failure, uh, Rubens Barrichello in the Stewart had a hydraulic failure, and there were five official non-qualifications, both Bernardis, both Arrows, and the Tyrrell. Um, I don't expect us to not qualify again in the future, so again, my apologies, and once again, do join me next time for some actual racing action.